Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 68th episode of VisionCon Live, your view go to nerdy talk show. I'm your host, Zach Wilson. Being come here to see me today, you came to meet the man of the hour. He's Mihawk from One Piece, D from Vampire Hunter D, General Criminal from My Hero Academia, just to name a few. He's a legendary actor with a badass voice that plays badass characters. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, John Grimian. John, how are you doing today? How you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, John, I thank you guys so much for watching today. And John, thank you so much for tuning in and joining us today. Now, before we get too much into it, though, we do have a quick word from our sponsor, guys, because ladies and gentlemen, this week's episode of Vision Con Live is brought to you by Anime Collectors United. ACU is your one-stop shop for all things anime, with plenty of community engagement, live autograph readings. The list goes on. It has a little bit to do with everything all anime lovers enjoy. Visit them online at their Facebook page, and thank you, ACU, for sponsoring today's episode. And Charlie, man, if you're watching this, this show really could not run without you. So we love you all the way over here at Vision Con, and thank you so much for all you do, Charlie. Uh, well, John, we got a lot to talk about, so let's just go okay. ahead and get into it. All so right. I listed off just a few characters of the many you have voiced throughout your career. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we won't have time to go through all of the characters you voiced, but there I are three. I won't remember all of them either. <laughs> That's fair. Well, there are three that I do want to tackle, but before we get to that, I did want to start us off with how we got here. Was showbiz always right. the plan? Or did something happen later on in life that kind of brought us to where we are today? You know, I've always been an actor since I was a kid. I did a lot of school plays and I also like, I like two things, two main things. I love being in theater and doing, uh, doing some acting and I did impressions since I was a little kid. So I did a lot of voices. Um, so I always knew I enjoyed doing that. And I also liked, I was a little Scorsese when I was a kid. I liked making little home movies with a Super 8 camera and being a director and making comic books and recording cassettes with my friends and stuff like that. So something along the lines of entertainment in one way or another, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I studied theater in high school here in Houston at the High School for the Performing Arts, and I graduated there. And then and I studied acting in New York for a couple of years at Juilliard. Juilliard had a four-year, they have a four-year training program, conservatory theater, and I got through two years, and I was cut. They used to cut the class down. So they don't do it anymore, but I didn't make that cut that year. And then I came back home. Then I ended up going to UT Film School in Austin. So I always wanted to kind of have a backup. I like doing theater and acting, but I didn't just want to try to be an actor and nothing but my whole life because, you, you know, a lot of people like to have a backup and so did I. But the voiceover uh, situation didn't really start until after film school. I mean, everybody knew I liked doing voices and I enjoyed doing a lot of audio recording, but I never thought, of it, thought about making a, a living at it. And I didn't know a lot about the industry. And so I started to record some commercials in Houston and make some money. And <clears throat> I realized it was, it was really fun. It was easy to do. It didn't take too long. It paid pretty well. And I was like, okay, this is something I want to pursue. And then in the late 90s, 1998, I think, uh, ADV Films, which is now Sentai, um, was the only, it was the anime uh, house in town. There was only one in Houston. That was ADV Films. And anime had not exploded like it uh, did in the 2000s and up to now again, like a resurgence of it. And they, they were starting this company and starting to re-record all this anime and they needed a pool of actors and they didn't have any voice actors. And so they just decided to uh, have open auditions. They used to have open cattle call auditions um, every, every couple of months. And I heard about them and I just went to one of them and we all sat in a room and waited to meet uh, the director, meet Matt Greenfield, who, who started ADV with John Ledford. And um, we just recorded some lines from like an episode of Dirty Pair or something like that. He wanted to hear what your voice sounded like, he wanted to give you a couple of scenarios. And then I got a job recording some Dirty Pair episodes. And as you got to know him, he, he, he gave me some more roles after that. It just, it just builds on that. And after a while, once you've gotten into in your foot in the door, the way it worked was that a lot of actors here in town, just about every stage actor I know in Houston has a long anime rap sheet. A lot of them do anyway. Very few of them have not done anime. A lot of them do commercials and we, we voiceover is a good, a good gig. Um, but uh, that's, how it, that's how it started. And then I met Mike McFarland who works at Funimation. I heard about Funimation as the other studio in Texas. And I, I talked to Mike on the phone. He said, send me a demo reel. And I'm 
from film school, I've been a video editor for as long as I've been a voice actor. I've also been a professional video editor. I do a lot of corporate work here in town and uh, for the medical center and other places like that. And so he, I cut together a demo reel from a lot of my old anime. And I think it's still up on my YouTube page and um, the one I sent him. And then I started working for Funimation. And so it just went from there. And I've been doing that for a total of 23 or four years now. So since 1998, that that's when it insane. kicked off. <laughs> well, we got a lot of characters to talk about real quick. So I want right. to start with them. So, and you kind of paved the way to my first one. Yeah. So, guys, when I said that you voice badass characters, John, I cannot think of many others that I'd like rather talk about than this next one. It's, he's from a show that I've recently fell in love with because hmm. it was a show I hadn't really given much of a shot yet until I fell in love with uh, my girlfriend, who this <coughs> show is their favorite. They've got the tattoos, oh. they've got the shirts, they've got the everything. Oh, look out, all right. Oh, yes. But they've, the show is called One Piece, so our first character that I want to dive deeper into, let's talk about the indomitable Mihawk. All right. Oh, look at this. <laughs> there he is. So before we dive a little bit more deeper into Mihawk, just give us a brief overview of the character, maybe fun anecdotes involved with getting and playing the part, anything at all, John. Oh, gosh. Well, I first heard about Mihawk um, the same way that I hear about most anime roles. Um, you get a, you know, typically you get a phone call from a director, like I said, who knows your voice already. And usually the way it works for me, <clears throat> excuse me, is the same way it works for a lot of voice actors, I think, is that the directors get to know your voice. And then they have, when they start casting a show, they have in their minds pretty much how they want a character to sound and or if they know it's your type of voice or within your range etc so they will just give you a call they'll cast you they'll precast you so i'll typically won't audition for a role i almost never audition for roles in uh in anime sometimes you do uh when directors want to hear a bunch of different uh uh choices to pull from which i think is a good idea but most of the time i just get a phone call and i just got a phone call from mihawk they said hey listen there's this guy we want you to play in a show called one piece and uh, I did not know anything about One Piece at all. I typically don't know a, you. I typically don't know anything about the roles I'm going to play or the shows that I'm in until I do them, which I kind of prefer because if you get too much of an idea in your mind about how something needs to be, it's like saying, "Oh, I've got to go do this famous role in a movie," or "I've got to do something that's getting a lot of attention," and that can kind of get in your head a little bit. But I remember the first session I did at Funimation for Mihawk, and it was only one scene where he walks into the room and meets the other warlords kind of makes an entrance and talks about the state of the union for those guys or the situation that they're currently in and that was it that was my intro to him and mihawk as a character i like him a lot he's supernaturally badass i mean he's one of those guys who <clears throat> you know he's got a really strong code of honor he has his own you know uh, feelings about integrity and and um, and having heart as a fighter and as a person and he's just got a very very strong code which I really like about him and I admire that and I like I like putting voice to that and what I also kind of like well I like it and I don't like it because <laughs> he doesn't show up very often you know if he showed up too often he would kind of wear on your nerves a little bit he would just show up and go hey I'm a badass, here I am. I mean, he's supposed to kind of come out when he's needed, do his thing, get out. You know, he, when we recorded the lines for Stampede, the movie One Piece Stampede, I had two lines. Something happened, I was on a beach, the smoke cleared, I said, well, I've done my job, let's go, and he, and he left. That's kind of who he, that's part of who he is, right? That's part of his image is to be such a badass that he doesn't need a lot of introduction, he doesn't need to show up very often, he's just like, the wolf in Pulp Fiction, he shows up and goes, hi, I fix problems. Goodbye, I'm out of here. And um, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but the downside of that <clears throat> is that I don't get to record him as often as I'd like to, because I really like him as a character. And we were having uh, a, another virtual panel with some of the other voice actors and, and cast of One Piece. And one of the questions came in, it was really funny, because one of the questions came in, which was, 
What's a what's something you do in the studio to get into your character? What's your little tick or your little trick to get into character? Oh, I like that. And everybody else had an answer. They said, "Oh, well, I just say the, these words and in the character, and that, that reminds me of how the voice sounds." Oh, well, I just act like I'm mad at Luffy. Oh, well, I just do this, and I just go, whoa, 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 and I try to get. And they asked me, and I said, "I don't have one because I, I what I do is I show up and go, hi, I haven't recorded this guy in like nine months. What does he sound like again? <laughs> can you can you play the last line back that I did?" Um, and I think I'll remember it because I don't remember his voice necessarily all the time. I do now. Uh, I decided to kind of start with um, Alan Rickman and Harry Potter, like Snape. I can hear it. <clears throat> I kind of started like with that whole, you know, voice. I don't do necessarily a good Alan Rickman with like the sly kind of thing. And then you just get rid of the accent, the British part, and then you're kind of left with someone who's talking a little bit sly and special like that, loves himself. Just a, that angle to it. There and it I is. Know, I don't know how many people talk like that, but that's just kind of what I ended up coming up with. Um, and I like it like that. I didn't want to make him in like an Aniko Montoya or a Frenchman. I've heard him as a Frenchman. I've heard him as a, a Spaniard, uh, a little exaggerated. I've heard very different takes on him, which are very interesting, but I just decided to keep him more like that, little, just a little sly but my voice just a little more nasal and and just very calm and very measured um never gets too excited unless he's telling zorro to get his act together that's about it <laughs> unless he's yelling at zorro from across the water after a big fight and um and i'm really happy with uh with the way it's turned out i'm i'm, I'm really happy that netflix picked it up and that it seems to be getting a um uh more fans jumping on board and getting to know the story as long as that story is, oh my God. Uh, don't know how many people are going to, you can't binge one piece. It's going to take a lifetime, but I hope Mihawk gets to come back in the future. I hope he, I hope he shows up every time he shows up. It's like for two lines. I just recorded some lines the other day. It was hey. like two of them. I was like, I want to have a scene. I want to do something or have a big fight. I don't know. I don't know what'll happen. Maybe the warlords will, maybe the warlords are going to be, I think they're going to go after them at some point in the future. Did I hear that in the manga or, and he's like waiting for them or something and there's That's gonna be more of a showdown because my girlfriend is all caught up with the subs so like all 900 mm. plus episodes so her and i are chipping away at the dub now and so <laughs> i see that because okay. i prefer the dubs over the subs that's just yeah my personal opinion okay so mm -hmm. yeah so we're chipping away at that so i gotta assume you know 900 plus episodes now i'm sure there's gonna be plenty of me He'll come back again at some point. Yeah. How exactly, when, and where is is the question? But you know what we've we've done. We re-recorded the East Blue stuff with better wow. animation, and there was a whole East Blue Blu-ray that came out through Funimation, and we re we re-recorded the lines, the whole fight with Zoro that we originally did in the earlier episodes. We redid it, uh, so it was One Piece East Blue Adventure, I think is what it's called. You can get it separately. And I'm not sure exactly how it fits into the whole thing or if it's just a separate retelling of that storyline or those adventures, but it's definitely different from the original and the animation looked a whole lot cooler. Um, maybe earlier I can, I, can screen, I can screen share, I can show you the scene I'm talking about. But yeah, we redid the Zorro fight. Wow. It was really cool. Yeah, it was really awesome. Heck yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, and I'll show it to you. Well, and you know, One Piece is one of the most longest running anime and widely regarded, especially now with the sudden resurgence now that you guys picked up the dub again. It's yeah. widely considered one of the best shonen animes mm -hmm. ever. And so you said it yourself, at the time you didn't exactly know about One Piece, hadn't really heard mm -hmm. of it. But now that you're you know, <laughs> in the thick of it and your character is very much beloved in an anime that has hundreds of characters, did you ever expect the anime to kick off to this degree, even though- No, now never. No? No, no, I never did. I learned slowly over time how big it was and how many episodes it had um, over the years. I said, wow, they're still making those? Hey, you wanna do some more episodes? Oh, we're making more? Which episode is this? Oh, 500 and something, what? <laughs> and, and then he's was like, okay, well, <laughs> where you find the time to watch those, let alone come up with new adventures? Okay, great, well, let's do this. And he's shown up in different battles and over the time skip and all this different stuff. And, uh, and then Monkey Island and, and, and meeting with Shanks again and, and this and that. And so uh, very slowly over the years as I went and recorded him, I think the first time I recorded him might've been 10 or 10 to 12 years ago, long time ago. And um, 
over time, I slowly got to realize how many episodes, then how popular it was, then that it got a resurgence. And so, no, I never knew anything like that, never expected it at all. I didn't know how many episodes there were at the very beginning when I walked in. It was very cold. Well, the next character I want to talk about, yeah. now, guys, vampires in anime, you know, it's nothing new now. It seems like there's a new vampire anime comes out every day. <laughs> But back in the day, even before I was born, there was but one man, one <laughs> vampire that was holding it down for the underground. For the next character we talk about, I want to talk about the one and only D from Vampire Hunter D. There he so, is. So like we did with Mihawk, give us just a brief overview of the character, maybe how you got the part, any fun anecdotes involved. Oh, I've, I've definitely got a fun anecdote about this one. Um, uh, I heard about this show for the very first time when I, when, I, when I showed up in the studio to record it. Someone called me from Sentai. And once again, as usual, they, uh, they said, listen, we just want you to come in and record this uh, show. I, I, the name escaped me and I, and I showed up at the studio and, I, and Matt Greenfield was re-recording uh, the audio and recasting and re-recording for Stereo Surround and for a Blu-ray release, a redub of this first movie where it's that started it all and I didn't know anything about it and not only did I know not not only was the show new to me but I didn't know about the fans the folklore the the sequels I knew nothing about what was going to happen and it didn't take us very long to record it because he doesn't say very much in this first movie he doesn't have a lot of lines he's got a couple of small speeches and some confrontations and for the most part he's pretty stoic and pretty quiet and he's, he reminds me of Mihawk in that way. He just shows up when he's needed. He gets the job done. I don't know why directors look at me and go, I mean, I, I appreciate it, I guess. Hey, <laughs> put Grammy on in that role. He's going to be the strong silent type. But he's got that, he's got that, uh, he's very protective. He's, he's a good guy at heart and he knows what he's doing and, and um, looks after not only the people in the story, but he also gives them advice and, uh, and helps them in the town. And when we recorded this, it took us, I think, about an hour and a half, and we were done. So we recorded the, his lines for this uh, redub of the original 1985 film in about an hour and a half, and it was like on a Tuesday or something. And so, and again, I'll remind you that you know when you when you do an anime, like I've done it, I've recorded an anime for about 23 years or so, and. Uh, John Swayze will tell you this. In fact, he's got a funny story. Sometimes when he goes to conventions and some people will ask him about characters that he can't remember, he'll just go, I don't know. Yeah, that ex I can attest because when we know. had him on the show, he did that exact thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, and I'll tell you why. You know, if you do a stage play and you do it over and over and rehearse a show and you get, get to know a character and you do a, the run of a Shakespeare play or a, 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 a name it, any kind of a musical or a drama, a stage play that you do, you get to know that character really, really well. You have weeks of rehearsal, you have different weekends where you perform it, it's on video, you remember a lot of things about it. But even that can fade from your memory after a sure. while, right? When you record an anime, there's tons of anime characters that I see again and I go, I played that, what was that? I, where was that? I don't, I don't remember that. Because you do it on one day and you get to know it just in that moment, you record those lines, you might, you, the director might say, hi, here's your character. Let's start with episode five or eight or six. You don't know what the context is. They give you a really quick rundown of what it is. And it's like an improv, an improv exercise mixed with a cold reading. And you're matching lip flaps and you're reading these English lines and trying to add some emotion to it while you're just getting to know what the story is for the very first time. It's like when you, it's like seeing a movie trailer and then being cast in the film and then you're done. So a lot of things from years ago, I can't remember, but what happened with Vampire D that was really funny is that <clears throat> if I see the anime again and I hear my voice, I'll remember it all. I'll go, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I remember that. I remember it was in the studio and recording it. So after we recorded D, I, you know, months went by, I kind of forgot about it, did some other anime, did some other things, and I didn't know a lot about the folklore, I did not know about, the, and I'm kind of glad that I didn't, again, because that would put too much pressure in your mind going into the studio. <clears throat> so, you have a more fresh approach when you don't know anything, you just kind of give it your all as an actor and you're done. Um, a friend of mine, she and her husband are complete fan geeks, 
and they love Vampire Hunter D. And she's a friend of mine. And when she found out that I recorded anime, she freaked out. And then when she found out I did this, she really fangirled out. And she called me and said, oh my God, congratulations on Vampire Hunter D. That was amazing. I can't believe you did that. And I went, uh, va Vampire what? <laughs> and she, she goes, Vampire Hunter D, John, you were recording Vampire Hunter And I just didn't remember the title. I didn't see it in front of my face and go, oh, yes, of course. And so I went, I don't. You, I think you might have me confused with somebody else. She goes, John, you, you, and AD and Sentai just did a re-release of Vampire Hunter D, and and you were in it. And he said, I, said, I don't think so. She goes, you were D, <laughs> the main character. And I just went, not following. I mean, it's like, like she's sitting there like face palming, and I'm like a total <laughs> derp, just going, I don't remember what you're talking about. Then when I saw it, I went, oh, yeah, of course that. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. OK, that's cool. And she just couldn't believe it. She thought I was like one of these snotty, aloof actors. <laughs> oh, yes, that thing that I recorded. Eh, it's not important. Yes, I did it on a Tuesday right before getting my dry cleaning and going to lunch. <laughs> so uh, so that was pretty funny. But then when I found out about all of the uh, I went down an Internet rabbit hole for a little while and I found out all about Vampire Hunter and I saw all the amazing artwork that people have done and uh and and all the fans the, the fans that followed the character through the sequels and bloodlust and the comics and i just went wow and 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 also that 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 is that movie is looked upon as being kind of where a lot of this a lot of things started for anime in that genre right it was either one of the first sci-fi fantasy vampire movies or animes that was done or something like that, but that it, it has a really big following, but I wasn't aware of that at all. And I, and I would argue as well, and first off, I'm gonna give <clears> you some <throat> slack because you said that took you roughly an hour and a half. Yeah, sure, right. I mean, this, this show is an hour long, so that's just 30 more minutes than this show. Right? Yeah, you're done, you're done. Exactly, like I wouldn't remember it. Right, right. But right. I would argue that it, the, it's ironic because the show itself, or no, I'm sorry, the movie itself, was so pivotal in the genre that I would right. make the argument that vampire-centric animes could not be a thing, or at least not to the popularity that they are, wow. if it were not for Vampire Hunter D. I even, yeah. guys, because I'm, I'll bring it up because I'm a recent fan of this anime too, Castlevania on Netflix, a hugely yeah. popular anime right. with centers right. vampires, I would make the argument that without Vampire Hunter D, there would be no Castlevania anime. Well, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, does... well, and I and yeah, and you know, and I wasn't the first. I wasn't the first uh, guy to record him. I think there's been at least a couple, mm -hmm. and I, and I haven't recorded a sequel, and I don't know if they've tried to redo or redub any of Bloodlust or any of the other other ones that came later. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard about that. Uh, Sentai hasn't talked about that. I'm not sure about it. But uh, that was the only one they redid. They wanted to make a 5-1 surround version on Blu-ray. And it's great, too. I think we got, I think we were nominated for an anime dub award for, like, ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. And I think I was nominated for a lead. And I found out all about that because my friend was telling me, you've got a nomination, you've got this. And I was sitting there going, what are you talking about? They didn't contact you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you don't find out about that stuff. If somebody reads about it, they'll let you know. That's wild. <clears throat> But the anime dub awards don't contact you, I don't think. I've not been contacted by them in the this past. Incredible. They make their they make their choices, and I don't think I won. I think someone else did. Sure. Um, but yeah, no, they don't they don't let you know. Still, I mean, you were nominated for the award. Usually, like when you see, hey, Emmy and nominated actor, like you know, it at least says nominated. That's still a high. Yeah, actor. yeah. And what's really interesting about uh, about doing voice acting for anime is that. Or, you know, voice acting for, for really anything. You know, when you do a radio commercial, you know, no one, no one has to see you. You don't show up on set. You can, you can feel however you want, look however you want. It's only about how you sound and what you bring to that. But when you're doing anime, animes are so intricate and involved and, and just it, the, the things that are happening to the characters are so out of this world and things like that. And you don't have to take care of any of that when you're the character. I, I don't have to look like Mihawk ever. I don't have to have the skills. He would flick me with a finger and I'd fly across the, you know, <laughs> you're, you're not that person. You don't have to do that. You're providing only one element of what's going to make that character, but it's still very important. So it's very important on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's like, whew, thank goodness I can just come in here and my, you know, I could go into a studio with my flip flops on and, 
it's going to go, hey, coffee, hey, what's going on? But you got to turn it on. You got to know how that it's a very interesting way to 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 act. Mm -hmm. it, there's a very interesting it's a very interesting facet of of uh, of the whole production being put together and, and coming together and gelling as a whole, having ju providing just the voice for it. But it's still really important. And we tell people it's not the same as, uh, hey, I, I can do voices or I can do this. Yeah. We always tell people it's all about the acting part. Uh, I always tell people acting. take acting classes, take improv classes, especially because when you take an improv class and you've got to just be thrown into a situation you've never seen before, that's exactly what happens when you go into an anime studio. You don't know what you're walking into. They're going to throw something at you. You're a guy who just escaped from prison and now you're fighting three guys in the street. Oh, okay. And what's my background? This, this, that, and the other. Okay. Got it. Go. What's he look like? Okay. I think he sounds like this. What do you think? You got to come up with a voice. So it's, it's very experimental almost, sure. you know, it's like, it's like an improv class. Well, it's probably for the best that you don't have to look like uh, Mihawk specifically because every man in that in one piece just is inexplicably jacked and with like got eight, eight pack abs. But anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, we're not quite there. We're, we're, well we're, guys, we're, we're approaching the halfway point. So I do want to reiterate something before we go on to the next character. I want to reiterate that fans of the show have already done this. Uh, a lot of you have already messaged VisionCon directly, your viewers' comments and questions, or put it in the live chat. But if you are new to the show, first off, welcome. But if you are watching this live on Facebook, you can either put your viewers' comments and questions in the live chat or message VisionCon directly, and we will read those as many as we can at the very end, guys. Awesome. With that said, I want to go to our final character, and this is a character that kind of came out of left field for me. Yeah. It's he is part of one of the most popular animes out right now. It is a character that I initially wrote off as just kind of like a, a quirky, you know, no pun intended, um, you know, kind of just a silly character that would be, <clears throat> but man, does he bring it. Man, is he powerful, but also his story is very impactful. So the yeah. last character I want to talk about is the one and only, the mischievous, gentle criminal. There he so, is. So to, so to wrap us up, John, just give us a brief overview of the character, any fun anecdotes involved with getting or playing the part. Right, at right. All. Gentle, um, I like him a lot. He's become my favorite character, actually. And even above Mihawk. Mihawk was my favorite character for a long time until I met Gentle. Gentle is, and the reason I like Gentle a little bit more is he's a little more three-dimensional. He's a little more vulnerable even though he's got a lot of power and he's very interesting, he's got a very deep backstory. And when I started, and then, then this is a role that I did have to audition for, absolutely. And I, had, and I had found out about my hero. I'd heard all these, everything was my hero day and night. Uh, I went to a couple of conventions and I met some people and all I was seeing was, was uh, cosplay for my hero, et cetera. And I said, well, what is this show? I need to find out more about it. And I found out there were so many cool characters in it that I start. it's one of the few animes that I've watched almost every episode of. I've followed it. I've followed uh, only a few in my, there's, there's so little time to, to watch all this series. I've watched a few of them that I've been in. But this was one that I started to watch before I ever got cast. And so I got to know the characters really well. I got to know the stories. And I just wanted all the background to be there already. And when I auditioned for it, I waited about a week until I found out. Uh, it was about a week until I found out I got the role. I was very excited about it. And I hadn't been to Funimation in a while. And we actually recorded the first, there were six episodes with Gentle. And we recorded three of them in the studio at Funimation. And then COVID shut everything down. Oof. And so as stories go, what's really cool about Gentle and La Brava is that is the same thing that's been happening for everything you've been watching at Funimation over the last year that's come out of Funimation has been every single actor has been recording all of their lines separately in their own homes. Wow. They have not gone to Funimation in over a you year. Know, Funimation is still not reopened in terms of their studios. So I went to the studio, the director's on the other side of the glass, the engineer's there, you're present in the studio, you talk in the hallway, you're there, not anymore. So. Once COVID hit, Funimation had to come up with a way to have the studio shut down. How do we get people recorded? And we found a way. Uh, I, think, I think Funimation actually has a documentary that they put up online about this. Um, they do. They do. It's really interesting. 
but they sent kits with iPads and microphones to anybody who didn't have their own home studios. Wow. So anybody they wanted to cast uh, uh, doing voiceover for any job at Funimation, everything you hear from then on for the last year that's come out from them, every actor's in their own home. And the engineers made it all work and sound like it was all from the same studio, which is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty great. Wow. So that's one story about that. So that interrupted the process of recording him. What I really like about Gentle and La Brava, and I've, I've said this before to, to other panels, some people talk to us and they go, you know what, it's really weird that, uh, that after this really serious arc with Overhaul that was very intense in the fourth season of My Hero, that all of a sudden we get these two characters that are kind of silly almost, and they're these YouTube personalities, and they're not really hurting anybody, and he doesn't really want to hurt, cause any harm, and he just wants to be mischievous and things like that. What's going on here? You know, what's up with that? And a couple of things come to mind for me. I, I like the fact that my hero can mix the intense with the silly, and they can, they can have heavier arcs, but if it was all heavy all the time, it would be a little too heavy. You've got to have some lighthearted arcs. You've got to have some other stuff. So I think it was just time to do that. But also what I really like about Gentle and La Brava that I think is interesting is that they've got very painful backstories. Both of them have really difficult, they've been through some really difficult times and they both want to be different people now. They both want to forget the people that they used to be. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to almost be different personas so that they can forget about their past. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they are social media personalities. And this gets a little deep, you know, because I don't know if, this, if the show is trying to give a message about social media that we shouldn't take it so seriously and we shouldn't make social media the be all end all, that it's a great, it's a great thing, but you shouldn't think to yourself, I'm nobody unless I have a lot of followers. I'm a nobody unless I make a big impression on YouTube or Twitter or TikTok. I'm a nobody if I, because that's not true. Everybody's, the message of the show is that everybody's important. Everybody's special. Everybody's got their own quirk, so to speak. Everybody brings something to the world that is, that matters, not just to them, but to other people. And you can be just as important a person, an artist, anything that you are, no matter how many followers you got, no matter what in this, there's some people put way too much importance on it to the point where they don't feel like they're even, they feel like they're a loser unless they have a huge following. And so I like the fact that they learn some lessons through their arcs about that. I think Gentle really learns one. I won't give it away, but, but you know, you, you, you are, you've got to, you've got to be yourself. You've got to be who you are. Don't try to be a different person. Um, to deal with your problems, right? And, and some people get on YouTube or on Twitter and, so, and they try to be somewhere, this is where I can be someone else. This is where I can be whoever I wish I was. That's re that really goes deep in terms of what the message is. So I think that's very interesting about those two characters. I, I kind of like that. I, I, I like thinking about that. And I've, th I've thought about that ever since we played those roles. Um, and Megan Shipman, who's incredible, who plays La Brava, she, um, I hope she and I get to go like to a con, a con or man appearance together in the future. I think that would be kind of cool. We've been talking about that. We thought that'd be fun. Um, but yeah, that's what I like about the show. I like those messages that they're putting out. And I like the, I like the idea of telling people, you got to be who you are. You can get a second chance. It's never too late to change. You can, you can have a redemption arc of your own, so to speak but don't try to pretend that you're somebody you're not, you know, you've got to deal with who you are and go from there. That's a pretty big message. And I think you might be onto something too, with all this, you know, the introspective lessons, because for a mm -hmm. show that markets itself as, you know, kind of baby's first anime. And I mean that with all the sincerity in the world, it's very approachable anime. Right. It's, it has a lot to offer for long-term anime fans, but it's also very easy to digest. It's very approachable for new time anime fans. Mm -hmm. But with that said, it also has plenty of, of times where it's just very introspective, very altruistic, really touches on heavy roles, you know, while also catering to a very large audience. So I think you might be onto something. Is it, what covers, I'm it covers a lot of ground. It, it's about superheroes. It's about, I mean, what kid has never wanted to be, pretend to be a superhero? 
Oh, and yeah. you've got, and the Harry Potter crowd loves it because it's like, it's about kids in school and their yeah. teachers who all have certain powers. And it, and it deals with a lot of, and it gives everybody, every individual character, a lot of different room to shine. Like I never thought I'd see an episode where somebody's sidekick for the rest of the season, hey, all of a sudden he gets one, one, uh, one episode where he, you know, fights a couple of villains and you yeah. get to know more about him. And they have all the room there to explore and make the show last a long time, which is very cool. Well, and just I hope, I hope that uh, I hope General and Brava get to come back one day too. I get, I oh hope they God. get a redemption. Well, and just like kind of focusing more towards General, the fact that he he's equal parts. Yes, he's quirky. Again, no pun intended. Yeah. But he's also very well mannered and serious and villainous. But so yeah. we're voicing just characters in general that are more complex, like Gentle. Are they ever harder or more difficult, rather, to voice than more two-dimensional characters? Or do they provide, in your opinion as an actor, do they provide a more well-rounded and unique experience? Yeah, definitely the second one. Definitely the latter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's Sometimes you can kind of provide on an, uh, you can rely on an actor's trick bag if you know you've got a two-dimensional person who's just gonna be mean or just gonna be this or that, or just gonna be the crazy guy, or it's not very well written or whatever, you can you can kind of pull something out of your trick bag to, to make that work for you vocally. But definitely where the acting comes in is when, when you know, and I knew everything about him. I mean, I, 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 I watched every episode uh, sub before we would record wow. the dub. And that's the only time I've done that either as well. And I like doing that. I liked being a little more prepared because as an actor, getting to know the, the script and the text and, and getting to know the situation and how it turns out for you before you have to do it really does come in handy. And, it, and I think it helps you give a, give a better performance potentially, but yeah, absolutely. All right, well kind of what, we'll go with this momentum a bit because I want to now explore, we talked about some characters and now I want to talk about your job specifically. Because okay. a lot of people who watch the show or attend in-person Vision Con or virtual Vision Con that we had last year and this year because of COVID, a lot of people, you know, join into these interviews because they obviously want to get to know more about these phenomenal guests that we have, one of which is sitting right before me. But a lot of them also, we've realized, watch these interviews because they either want to get in the entertainment industry or already are and just want to know what to do next, kind of level up their game. So I want you to keep that in mind for these next two questions. The okay. first one has to involve rejection. Now, like I always say, guys, rejection is just a part of life, no matter how you look at it. However, I would say if there was ever an industry that rejection is most prevalent, it would definitely be your industry, which is, of course, the entertainment industry. So yeah. mm -hmm. folks watching at home that fit into either of those categories that either want to get in the entertainment industry or already are and just want to know what to do next, how would you, someone as successful as you are, like to advise them to handle rejection once it inevitably comes? Gosh. Um... Well, like you said, I mean, you put it pretty well that rejection is absolutely going to be a part of any industry that you're in. I've auditioned for tons of commercials and other jobs and gigs and straight stage plays and things like that where I don't get the part or have a lot of dream roles in my mind that I know I'll never get because I'm either too old to do them now or I didn't get a chance to do them when they came up or I, I auditioned for them and I didn't get the part. Um, and one thing that comes in very handy for me just mentally is, is knowing that uh, is just, you know, enjoying and savoring the ones that you do get um, <clears throat> because you're always going to learn from them and you're always going to have a great, there's always going to be stories and great experiences from doing that. Rejection is tough for anyone. Uh, first of all, you uh, don't fall into the trap of thinking that, that there's people out there who can handle it well. In fact, <laughs> you could argue that even some of the coolest people that you think are the coolest and most badass ever, if they had to handle rejection and they haven't before, once they do, it's a lot harder for them to deal with it. Huh. If people are spoiled and they get what they want and they are always told they're good and no one ever has to challenge them and they never have to deal with it until way later in their career, they can typically uh, find themselves in a situation where it's a lot tougher in a later in in later life 
to handle something that they've never had to handle before. So learning how to handle rejection in your earlier life is a very good skill to have. It's, it thickens your skin. It really helps you deal with things later because then you've been there, done that. You go, okay, I know what this means and I got over it and it'll be okay. And you have that already stored. You already have that in your, in your locker, you know? If you never experience rejection, you'll never know how to experience it. You've got to go through it a little bit. You've got to pick yourself up and dust yourself off. And just keep in mind that just about anybody who's worth their salt, anyone who the best people in any industry have been told at some point in their lives that they suck. <laughs> some teacher said, you suck. You shouldn't do this. Somebody, some friend of theirs who was jealous said, you're not very good at this. Somebody tried to knock them down. It's, it's, it's just part of life and um, expect it, expect that it'll happen. Just say, you know what, this is part of the deal. It's like, it's like gambling. It's like, you know, you play cards, you're going to lose sometimes, or you're going to lose this baseball game. You're going to lose this pool match. You're going to lose whatever. It's just going to happen to you. Um, it's, it's part of how you grow and it's part of how you become better at what you do. It's just keep it as a reminder, but don't let it upset you. And don't ever think that any one person or any group of people has some knowledge that no one else has about what is really good and what isn't. Because everyone throughout history has been surprised about what people like, about what they accept, about what is going to really be a hit. You know, uh, you can look at some of the best movies that have ever come out. Well, when they were making it, Everybody thought it was going to flop, right? So you, you can't take it so seriously that you let it get you down and you let it get in the way of your vision and what you want to do. So don't let anybody ever tell you that you suck. If they say that, just go, oh, that's too bad. That's more of a reflection on you. And I can't let that affect me. Just, you know, plow through and expect it to be something that's going to be a good um, uh, part of your toolbox, your toolkit for growth. A lot of people, at least that's how it seems anyway, especially for voice acting in general. Mm -hmm. When you don't get a part, it's often not because you were bad, you just weren't what the director was looking for. Do you find that's absolutely you correct? That? No, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of directors, if you're a serious director, you you are going to have something in your in mind that you want to hear. You're going to have a tone that you I can't tell you how many, uh, how many um auditions I've done, especially voiceover auditions, and I don't get it. And then I hear the commercial on TV and it's like, I could have done that if you would have told me that's what you were looking for. Maybe I could have mimicked it or done it. I didn't know you wanted it to sound like that. Yeah. Crap, I did a whole different thing. You might have been able to do it, but you walked in one day and the director didn't hear exactly what they had in mind. And so they just say, well, I, I don't, you know, maybe you could have. So it doesn't mean that you can't do or couldn't have done the job. Sometimes it's just, you just didn't get the part. That happens too. There's a lot of parts I'd like to play that it's like, man, I hear this anime or I hear this other voice. I go, God, I could do that. Yeah. You know, but it's just not what I walked in with. Hmm. So sure. another good idea is to tell the direct is to ask the director, you know, is there something you want to tell me about? Is there a voice you have in mind that I could try to, to mimic or nail that you're looking oh. for? If you don't hear the tone, could you tell me that? And I do that real well because I'm a mimic and I, I imitate, I am, I can't do anybody, but some of the better jobs I've gotten have been that they've sent an audio file with the audition saying, we're looking for this. Can you try to match this as, oh, as well as possible? You know, that's tough because some, yeah, it's better if you hear it for me sure. than for someone to describe it. Because a lot of directors don't know what they want. Hey, man, I'm looking for a Matt Damon meets Seth Rogen, but with a Hugh Jackman feel. It's like, <laughs> oh, believe me, we've heard some crazy stuff. Well, like polar opposites. That's right. <laughs> But they want an element from each one, you know, it's like, yeah. that doesn't exist. Exactly, like, let me just conjure something that doesn't exist. But, That's exactly right. But, so, going with this momentum, yeah. is there any advice that you would give the folks watching at home that want to get in the entertainment industry? Maybe advice that you wish you had when you first started out? Oh, gosh. Well, when I was in school at Juilliard in New York, the first thing they said to us on the first day when we showed up, in New York City, in Lincoln Center at the Juilliard School was, hi, welcome to New York. If there's anything else that will make you happy, do that instead. Oh my God. Because <laughs> they said, this is such a difficult industry and it's such a tough one to make a living. 
and it's such a difficult one to to uh, to be happy and make a living and be be good be good in etc. That it's just not worth it unless you've just got to do it and you can't do anything else. And I don't know if I would give somebody that harsh a piece of advice, but my biggest advice would be just to do whatever you can do to try to enjoy it as much as you can, because so much of it is is unfortunately for a lot of people taken up with you've got to be this you've got to be this good if you're not you'll fail it's only pass or fail and there's a there's a whole enjoyment to be had in being an actor and being a performer where you're just enjoying what you're doing and getting the charge from the audience or just the joy of doing the craft that gets lost because people think too much about the critics or did I do this right? Or am I going to be famous or am I going to make a living at this? Or is this going to be so much, there are so many elements of it that are negative and that beat you down that you lose the, the, the enjoyment of it. Sure. The enjoyment of it is what it's all about. And the best stuff you're ever going to see is going to be inspired and it's going to feel like people really had a good time doing it. Right. Hmm. So you've got to have a good time doing whatever you're doing. If it just sucks to do it, then either do something else or think about something else that you enjoy or what is it about this that is getting me down? Is it what other people are saying? Is it like, what should I be ignoring? What should I really be focusing on? It's all about what does this mean to you? And you know, the other thing I tell people, it's like, boy, I don't wanna, I don't, playing this role is really tough. Well, imagine in your mind to tell the audience, hey, you get up here and do this. Yeah, ooh. Most of them like can't. That. Yeah, you do it. Yeah. Show me how. Show me how it's better. Most people who criticize people for being either good or bad can't do it either. Yeah, they're throwing stones in glass houses. Oh yeah, exactly. Don't don't. Yeah, that's a waste of time. That's like that's a classic piece of advice. Yeah. And what I tell people when they go to auditions too is one good thing to do when you go to an audition or a job interview or anything is pretend you already got the part. Pretend you already got the job, Ooh. and you're just there to discuss salary or you're yeah. just there to rehearse a little bit but you already got it, it's already done. So that it's not about the pressure of getting it, it's about focusing on what you enjoy about it. Or pretend you walk in and you're from the future and you know things that no one else knows. You've got the goods on everybody. You walk in with a whole different kind of confidence when you feel like that, right? Mm -hmm. If I go record Mihawk today, it's like, oh yeah, I've got this part, yeah, I've already got it. I'm yeah. like, am I gonna get this part? Oh my gosh, I have a, look at my face, I'm worried. Yeah. Instead of, oh yeah, it's me. There's me, Hawk. Cool. He's coming in the door. Yeah, the no confidence. Problem. Do what makes you con do, think of what is ever going to help you feel confident and enjoy what you're doing. Enjoyment breeds confidence and that breeds success. Totally. Yes. Now you yeah. have all the skills necessary to become the next John Grenier. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, guys. Well, before we get to viewers' comments and questions, if you haven't already, message Bishop <clears throat> directly or put in the live chat your viewers' comments and questions. Now is your final chance to do so because, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the plug zone. John Gremian, now uh -oh. is your opportunity to plug, promote, advertise, whatever verb you want to use, anything you want. The floor is yours, sir. Well, you know, we were talking before we went live about conventions and how COVID has affected the convention scene, and which has really been unfortunate. I've really enjoyed doing a lot of these virtual ones. Um, but I'm going to try to get back out there. Uh, I'm fully vaccinated and I, I encourage other people to be so. And I've heard what I needed to hear from people I trust about how safe I can be if I'm careful enough. And I would like to get out there and meet fans again. And if you are in a city that I've never been before, and I probably haven't, <laughs> because I used to I used to be doing stage acting so often that my weekends were always booked up all through the 2000s. And so I didn't get to go to a lot of conventions and I didn't try to go to a lot of conventions because I was doing a lot of stage acting. So I'm a little newer on the convention scene and I really enjoy getting out and meeting people and having panels with other actors and doing this kind of stuff. So if you'd like to see me, uh, let, let your local con, uh, let your, let go to the local uh, website of your local con in your city or town and, and let them know, give them a request that you'd like to see me and we'll see what happens. And hopefully I can get out to see you sometime. Uh, I have a website. Uh, called johngrimion.com. Oh, and on that website, there he goes, you can get these custom prints of some of my characters. And by the way, these were all, these are all original. This is all original art that was done by a very wonderful artist. Her name is Sarah Madura. 
gotta give her a gotta give her a shout out. I was actually now that you mention it, Sarah Madura is actually in the chat right now. Oh, great! Hi, Sarah. <laughs> it's great to see you. Thanks for showing up. Well, Sarah is an amazing person. She's really sweet, and she's also this incredible. You can see the work before you; it speaks for itself. Uh, she does an amazing job uh, with these prints. She's an incredible artist, and she can, um, I think, draw any style of anime that I've seen for any of the actors that I've seen on myself, she can just lock into it. And uh, so those prints are available on my website. They're also available at um, something called the Voice Actor Store, which is a different website. I think you've got that too. Yeah, um, you can go to the Voice Actor Store. The thing that's unique about that website is that you can go there and get, you can pick and choose and shop around and you can say, I want a Mihawk print from John Gremion, but I also want a signed Funko Pop from, Chris Waycamp from My Hero, or Damon Mills, or Jimmy Markey, or whatever, who's ever on that site, Josh Greeley, all these other people who are on that site, their uh, prints and Funko Pops and other things and personal uh, shout outs and audio file, there's D, are available as well. And you can put them all into one cart from different actors, and that can be a part of your order. So the voice actor store is there for you to peruse that's, as well. And that's so convenient too. Yes, it is. It's definitely very cool. And then I know I personally am probably going to pick up this Mihawk one personally. And you then, bet. So, and so real quick, for our audio listeners who weren't able to see all of this on the screen, can oh, you right. real quick uh, say your website and then the website they can find these ones? Yes. There? Yes. Uh, Thevoiceactorstore.com is all spelled lowercase is where, uh, is where the voice actor store is. And then just my name, johngremion.com, is www.johngremion.com is my website. And I try to keep it updated with the most recent news and announcements and appearances and things like that on the main page. Uh, my, my voice actor demo is there. Uh, work I've done as an actor is there. And those prints are there in the store. Um, also, I'm on Twitter. Just at, uh, it's at Jay Grimm is my uh, very short Twitter handle. Probably too short. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I need to update my YouTube page because I, my YouTube page is really simply uh, just most of my video editing that I've done. But my voice actor demo reel is on there too. So that's, that's always a lot of fun. But yeah, m most of my, um, my biggest, my biggest uh, desire right now is to just hit the road again and travel and see people again. I mean, everybody's been, we've all been cooped up. We've all had quite a year and, and then some of having to, uh, and I took it pretty seriously. I stayed home a lot. I was really careful. Good. And I did a lot of virtual cons and I took care of myself and, um, and it's, it's, it's real important for us to be able to get out there and be social and see each other again. And I'm really looking forward to it. I hope to go to some more cons in the future. So I'd say we had uh, the second virtual convention this year. Yeah. And, you know, it's fun. You know, it is, I'll, I'll be lying if I said it wasn't a, a tiny bit more convenient, be obviously because not as much uh, background work has to be done. It's more just, you know, the tech side of it, mm. uh, but it's just not the same. Right, right. No, yeah. no, it's not. It's and not. obviously it caters to public health, and that's what's most important. But absolutely, I think absolutely. we're all rearing for some in-person conventions now. Well, you know, I'll say this. I mean, and and if people, uh, I know it can be controversial, but I, I'm very much on the side. Much I've I've always been much more on the side of being safe, uh, being more safe than sorry. Um, I would say to everybody, get get your shots, get vaccinated oh. if you can. You know, you can't force it, but but I would recommend it, uh, just because. You know, uh, everything I'm hearing and everything I've experienced from people I really trust, because I do a lot of videos for the medical center and I talk to people who are specialists and, and they all agree that it's just, it's just the best thing to do. It's the safest thing you can do to, uh, to make sure that we can all just be together again in the future and not worry so much about this anymore. It's been such a burden for people to worry about it so much and uh, get out there and be safe. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of convenience, man, it is so convenient to schedule too. So yeah, guys. Oh, yeah. Guys, I highly recommend you guys you know, get vaccinated. I know we're kind of getting off base. Oh, don't worry. We'll go back to viewers' comments and oh, questions. Good. But uh, get Mihawk vaccinated. Would, Mihawk would get vaccinated. There you go. There you He'd go. He'd do it. <laughs> Jericho right, would tell you to do it. So I've got all, the, if you're watching this live on Facebook, I've got all those links and more in the live chat. Or if you're watching this later on YouTube or listening to this later on Spotify, it's going to be mm. all down there in the YouTube description box, guys. Oh, great. And with that, we're going out of the plug zone and going to our final segment, Viewers, comments, and questions. So we got about time for about five or six. So real quick, let me pull up the messenger and I'll read some from the messenger, some from the chat. Okay. So real quick, I'm gonna go up. Okay, so Chris tuned in and said, hey John, I see you're credited in Ghost Stories. 
one of the best dubs ever. Was your experience dubbing for that anime any different than compared to, say, My Hero Academia? Oh, yeah, sure. Ghost Stories was very unique and very fun because, of course, it was uh, Stephen Foster was the director. We recorded that a long time ago at, at uh, what was then ADV <clears throat> here in Houston. And I wasn't I didn't play a major character. I think I played a cab driver and a couple of other small characters. You just some goofy guys in there. And I haven't watched it in forever. And I need to watch it again because a lot of people talk about Ghost Stories because it's so much fun. And it was so unique and so different because we they practically got to rewrite the entire script and just to be just to kind of make it more comical and fun and interesting and and wacky and so yes that was very different because we, we there was a lot more laughter in the studio we got to improvise a little bit more the lines were rewritten they were on a script but we had the freedom to goof around with them a little bit and that's when you have the most fun in the studio and when that works in an anime because most of the time when you record anime you have these moments that are funny and you wish they could end up in the anime. You know, you goof around and do some stuff with the character and then you're like, oh man, can you put that in there? That would be so funny. And the director, I can't do that. No, of course not. We'd get sued. People would be, people would be furious. Fans would go, no, that's blasphemy. You can't do that. But, uh, but Ghost Stories was the opposite. Ghost Stories was, yes, what's funny? Let's put it in there. Let's do it. So yeah, that was a big difference on that show. That it seldom when an anime gets me to like side splitting pain from laughing. Oh so yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> All right, so Raylene tuned in and said, "Hey John, I just want to know what do you like most about Mihawk?" What do I like most about Mihawk? Um, that he's so sure of himself, that he's so good at what he does that it's almost like a curse. You know, there's a movie, there's a movie that was made in the 80s called Excalibur. It was about, you know, the, the, the Knights of the Round Table and Lancelot, Sir Lancelot, he reminds me of Sir Lancelot because Sir Lancelot has a speech and he says, it's not a blessing that I'm so good. It's a curse because I can't meet my match. And he wants someone to be able to beat him. And he's so admiring of Zorro who never gives up that he's like, wow, this guy would rather die than be defeated. And that goes so, he's got such a strong moral code and, and respects that so much about people, their absolute dedication to whatever they're doing. And he's so just zen and badass about that. I mean, what's not to admire about oh. that in a character? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Keith tuned in and a little <clears throat> bit off the wall, but he said, what's your favorite Disney film as a child? Oh, gosh, probably Fantasia, believe it or not. I was a little kid and I saw Fantasia and it's got such a mixture of, you know, it's Mickey Mouse as the Sorcerer's Apprentice and it's got dancing hippos doing ballet and it's got, <laughs> it's got, oh man, this is going back. It's got sad, happy, fun, other Disney films. What are my other favorite Disney films? Disney Fantasia is awesome. Oof, probably Dumbo. Dumbo okay, was a yeah. good one. Yeah, yeah. But probably Fantasia because it was so unique. It was so interesting and it was all based in music because I'm a musician and I, I really, I kind of, I really dug it. I thought this is a bold way to make a film, yeah. but it's that's going way back. I was about to say, I I watched Fantasia as a, an adult, and I'm jealous of you because I mean, I loved it as an adult, but like I can't imagine watching it as a child. But just the wonder, <laughs> the fact that it's all through music, like oh, oh yeah, right, right on. But that's well, a good question. So we got time for two more guys. The next okay. one is from Jillian, who said, so she first says, "Gotta love that Houston weather," referring to our uh, pre-show conversation about the weather. But uh, then she says, other than the opportunity to improvise, what else is your favorite part about voicing anime? Story, characters, theme, etc. What's my favorite part about voicing anime? Besides the improvision. Well, well what I was saying earlier about the improv experience, the improv of it, uh, the, the challenge of it. The challenge of it is to walk in completely blind about not knowing a story and working with a director to, to hone your, it helps you hone your craft as an actor and an improver, improvisation, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? An improv guy. There you go. No. <laughs> no, it just helps to hone your improv skills. And that helps you as an actor when you do things that are even scripted because you learn to off the cuff and on the fly very quickly and easily come up with a voice, a mood, a character for someone. And it's a, it's a technical challenge and it's a challenge as an actor all in one. And the challenge of that is what I really like. And, and when you can leave an anime studio going, you know, I think we nailed it. I think we really did a good job 
with this, uh, with this character, knowing that you were able to come up with it really quickly, uh, means that you're, you're still, you've still got it. You've still got, you've got real good improv skills as an actor. So right. it, it helps to hone those things. Well, then the last question is from Ryan, who he first heard with, uh, hi, Zach, why fix what ain't broke, right? He says this because this is the same question he does with every guest. Oh, but, okay. Uh, what are some of the characters that you voiced throughout the years that you wish had more of a spotlight? Oh, wow. Well, Mihawk's one of them. I mean, he's got to be who he is, but I wish he would, I wish he would show up more often and help people have more battles and, and, uh, and have more long speeches and maybe be philosophical, have, have more scenes like that. Uh, what are some of the other characters I've played that I think have more spotlight? Uh, so, I mean, I said it earlier. I, I hope Jenel gets to come back. I hope they like go to him in his prison cell and say, We're, you're out of here. We need you. We need you to... <laughs> <laughs> need you to throw air. We need you to be yeah to to add your elasticity to the to the air and the problem. Boy oh boy, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> there was a character I played in Peacemaker way back in the day for ADV that was that was um, uh, really really cool, really long hair in the face. He was he was he was really a bad kind of character, and I liked him a lot. Cromartie High School is one of my favorite animes that I've ever ever done. A uh, character called Yutaka Takanuchi, who was the school bully who also got car sick. And so he didn't want anybody to know he was a wuss. So he has a really tough voice, a really gruff voice like that. But he's a but he's he doesn't want anybody to know. And I thought playing him was so much fun because there's nothing cooler than like a real tough guy yeah. who's got the who's got the like the jawbreaker with the soft center. You know, he's like, that's really cool. I like that a lot. Um, and I wish he had done more in the show. And I wish they would do a sequel. I love that show. That was oh, super What was it called again? Cromartie High School. Ooh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a really funny show. Well, guys, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 68 of VisionCon Live. Before we wrap things up, though, John, are there yes. any final thoughts to leave us on? Sage-like wisdom, anything at all? Oh, just, <clears throat> you know what? Just be health, stay healthy, stay safe these days. Be good to each other. Uh, don't take social media so seriously that you let it get you down. <laughs> you know, it's for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can really bother you if you let it, don't let it, you know, be yourselves and, and, and be real, you know, and go for what you want to do, do what you enjoy. Don't let people tell you that you can't do what you enjoy because life is too short and you've got to enjoy life. And the only way to enjoy life, as far as I'm concerned, is to do what you love. And I'm extremely lucky to do what I enjoy. Um, and so that, that's the best advice I can give. That's, that's pretty rote advice. I think a lot of people would give you the same ones, but that it, there's a reason. There's a lot of value to it. Um, gave me goosebumps all the same. Yeah, don't get stuck. Don't, get st don't feel you have to be stuck doing something because there's no other way out. There's always a different way to do what you enjoy in some way or another, even if you don't get paid for it. Yeah, I get paid for something else, but do something on the side where don't ever put your eggs in one basket. Have different baskets. You well, know? I, I know what you're talking about. It still gave me goosebumps. You bet. Oh, great. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 68 of VisionCon Live. Thank you so much for watching. Thank As you for always, having me. Oh, my God. Thank you. As thank always, you. I'm your host, Zach Wilson. But much more importantly, this has been my very special guest, John Grimian. Make sure to check out all the links down in the description box below, guys. And until next time, guys, always remember that life's better when you have friends to share it with.